Over to you, Brian. All right. Thanks, Alan. Um, today, I'm going to I'm going to talk about uh, corrosion studies. So I do materials degradation, and, and it's it's a nice opportunity for me to talk to the community and specifically to tell uh, and share uh, the experiences that I have had, specifically in the last five years, uh, in which we have seen such an improvement in our abilities to to use new equipment and facilities to start to understand some of these corrosion processes that, that, are, that are quite important to industry. Uh, so I'll state the obvious. Uh, corrosion is, is all around us. Uh, it costs over $2 uh, trillion per year to the industries. Uh, it leads to all sorts of unexpected failures, uh, leading to, to downtime of businesses, uh, as well as to, in some, tie, some cases, fatalities. Uh, it is one of the most important issues facing industry today. Uh, that being said, uh, by understanding materials degradation uh, at the fundamental levels, uh, we've got the potential now uh, to provide significant impact to a range of industries, uh, including aerospace, energy, and transport. Corrosion itself is, is a very diverse and multidisciplinary field. Traditionally, we tend to study corrosion uh, once it is well developed and try to create laws uh, that will tell us when the corrosion becomes critical. Recent advances in characterization, characterization tools, imaging, computational capabilities, and fundamental theories have created opportunities for the advancement in understanding of the solid liquid interfaces down to the nanoscale in corroding metallic systems. Now we can, we can now use these new techniques to understand the basis for where corrosion begins. So we can start to answer questions such as why does it occur in some places on a metal and not others? What causes a protective film to develop? And what makes it stable? And what makes it unstable? Opportunities also now exist to understand these processes in order to develop in order to develop uh, new highly resistive alloys as well as smart films and smart coating inhibitor systems. The technological needs and challenges associated with corrosion are particularly acute as our society moves forward. We have increased challenges as we, we develop nanoscale devices which are dependent on the stability of every atom in their system. Uh, we are increasingly seeing the use of engineering materials in complex and harsh environments, and uh, we are, are seeing an increased reliability in the needs over a long time term, uh, epitomized by such challenges such as healthcare appliances and those in engineering nuclear waste. Uh, Alan has, uh, has just, just asked me to, uh, to tell you all uh, that if you have any questions, uh, please just type the questions online. And, uh, and we'll, we'll take care of them at the end of the, end of the program. All right. OK. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the hierarchical nature uh, of corrosion itself. And so the underlying fundamentals uh, for corrosion inform the various unit processes, which together form sets of coupled processes that contribute to the understanding of the multidisciplinary corrosion science. So, Underlying fundamentals such as, as thermodynamics and kinetics provide uh, uh, information uh, into processes such as films and scales and solid fuel interfaces. These then uh, feed into our understanding of corrosion control and localized corrosion uh, and complex uh, alloy dissolution. On top of that, modeling, the aspects of modeling that we use to support corrosion control and localized corrosion and understanding these processes uh, are sub supported by all of this. All right. The fundamental laws themselves of thermodynamics uh, for scales and bulk materials, uh, for interfaces and for, for the electrolytes that they sit in, are critical inputs to crucial unit processes such as transport, adsorption, redox reaction, and precipitation. These unit processes in turn operate in concert to regulate the events taking place during corrosion. It should be noted that corrosion often occurs in sequences or series. For instance, a, a coating or an inhibitor may fail and it'll lead to localized corrosion and that might lead to stress corrosion cracking 
fatigue cracking and eventual failure of the component. Uh, there is a multi-scale uh, 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 association with corrosion. So corrosion involves multiple processes occurring at different length scales and time scales. These are usually in combination, uh, but there are certain uh, hierarchical uh, relationships uh, with one another ultimately governing uh, uh, the engineering scale behavior. Uh, most cases, we will need multiple simultaneously tools in conjunction with compu computational modeling to characterize corrosion at a submicron level. Or, or indeed, we would need new techniques in which we can perform in situ or in operando basis uh, when required. All right. What I'm going to do today, uh, I'm going to give you an example of a, a couple of uh, programs. Uh, two of them are in Europe, two of them are in the US, uh, that will focus on, on, on one of these critical unit processes. And it will be a nice example of how we've been able to use new techniques and new equipment uh, to, to get a better understanding of, of some of these uh, nanoscale uh, uh, components of films and scales and solid and liquid interfaces. Uh, I'll also talk about uh, some, some development of some equipment uh, here at Manchester uh, in terms of corrosion control. All right, so first of all, I'll, I'll talk about uh, the solid fuel, fluid uh, interface and, and how uh, some new techniques are, are helping us understand uh, what is going on uh, in this initial process uh, of corrosion. So I'm going to talk a, a little bit about some work that's uh, been done uh, in, in NIMSEC's group. Uh, and he is working on aqueous solution metal interfaces uh, investigated in operando by uh, ambient pressure XPS. All right. So ambient pressure XPS uh, is an in operando approach, uh, which basically means it's an in-situ approach where you are controlling some type of action on the material, whether it's a polarization, et cetera, or a heat spike, et cetera. All right. And so ambient pressure XPA, XPS uh, is an approach uh, for the investigation of heterogeneous processes at solid liquid interfaces, uh, taking into account elemental and chemical specificity, uh, which combine the preparation of thin, uh, thin liquid films using a meniscus method uh, with the standing wave ambient pressure uh, X-ray photoelectrochemical photoelectron spectroscopy. All right. The technique itself provides information about the chemical composition across the liquid solid interface with sub-nanometer depth resolution. Right. So the main thing that makes uh, APX XPS uh, uh, so important and such a, a, a major step forward is that it, 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 it uses something called uh, the SWAPS uh, method. And in the SWAPS method, you, you're using a, a standing wave ambient pressure photo emission spectroscopy. Right. And so what you do there, you're basically performing your electrochemical test uh, on a substrate, which gives a very good uh, uh, control of angle of incidence and uh, uh, direction uh, of uh, uh, interaction perpendicular to the surface. All right. So if we take a look at, at this example, we've got a, a silicon molybdenum and silicon oxide substrate in which we are building on uh, some type of reaction. In this case, we have, have a, a, a bit of nickel uh, uh, alloy. Oh, well, it's nickel, pure nickel, actually. And what we are doing is we are exposing uh, this to an environment, in this case, a potential. And we are growing either an, an oxide or, or uh, uh, oxide films. Mm -hmm. So. Swaps, when combined with, with the hard X-rays and, and the, the preparation of a very thin solution layer, uh, is, is an approach that characterizes the components of the liquid uh, solid interface with bulk species in the liquid and solid and species located at the interface under potential control. If we take a look at the figure, we easily see that 
uh, in an as prepared state or uh, 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 as prepared vacuum state, uh, we get uh, the nickel oxide growing on a nickel substrate. If we expose it to, uh, say, one molar KOH, we now get something completely different. We now get completely cons consumed uh, state of, of the nickel into a nickel oxide, uh, and we have really nice information as far as uh, uh, link scale. And so the resolution, again, is, is sub-nanometer, and so we get very good information on that type of scale length. Now, these type of experiments and measurements uh, are not actually possible in, in a conventional XPS experiment uh, without the use of the standing wave method. So the development of the standing wave method gave, it provides us with a, a, a new resolution. Uh, a new improved resolution. And this resolution of this method is probably even going to get better. And it's going to increase uh, uh, due to, to several different things. Uh, uh, more usage of the measuring techniques using the Keswick fringes uh, adjacent to the Bragg Peak. All right. Another, another uh, example of, of uh, how new facility and new equipment uh, have improved our understanding of, of, of corrosion processes. Uh, I'll talk uh, uh, about some, some of the work that is being done in Philippe, Philippe Marcuse's group uh, looking at corrosion scales and passive films. All right, so Philippe is, is working on looking at, and has been doing this for years, uh, he looks at the effect of molybdenum on the composition and nanoscale morphology uh, of passive stainless steel. So he's looking on, uh, on the effect in, in, in alloy 316 uh, of, of what, what moly does. Uh, so stainless steel uh, uh, are used ubiquitously throughout industry. And it's due to the fact that it has a very high corrosion resistance. And the corrosion resistance is due in part to the alloying of the, of the material with moly. With Molly, the addition of, of, of Molly to 316 gives so much better performance over something like 304 stainless steel. The, the beneficial role of the molybdenum uh, on corrosion resistance has been long discussed within the field, and several effects have been proposed. Uh, but we still don't quite understand what Molly does uh, to make 316 such a, a stainless material. Right, so the, the, the two camps can be sorted between two uh, main classes, depending on whether you, you believe that, that Molly is, is, is there to mitigate the passive film breakdown or it's there to promote passive film repair. Right. So let's take a look at some of the, some of the work that Philippe has done. So he's been able to apply uh, tough sims uh, to look at the chemistry uh, uh, and, and the location of the moly uh, within the stainless steel oxide. And he's looked at it in three different cases. So uh, just a natural condition uh, as well as two uh, uh, aging conditions or heat treatments. So he's looked at the natural oxide that forms in air versus two aging treatments, one at two hours, one at 20 hours. All right, so he's looked at at uh, iron oxide ions, the chromium oxide ions, and the molybdenum oxide ions. So if we take a look at molybdenum, we see that the, the molybdenum actually sits at the near surface to oxide interface in the natural, naturally forming oxide. As you age the material, this presence shifts and enriches toward the, uh, the outer oxide in both the 2-hour and the 20-hour uh, aging treatment. If we take a look at uh, where the chromium and the iron sit, we see that, that the chromium uh, is in the near oxide, whereas the iron is always going to be in the, the far outside oxide. All right. Another thing that, that uh, uh, Philip has been able to do is he's been able to, to combine the top sims data with some XPS data. And so the XPS data that, that he has used has shown again that, that moly is, is, is very much so present in, in the oxide layers, uh, predominantly in the inner oxide layer. 
So if you take a look at the schematic, this is the model that, that Philippe, Philippe proposes, uh, in which you have a iron-rich outer oxide layer with some MOLLE 4 plus and MOLLE 6 plus uh, incorporated within the material, uh, as well as an inner oxide layer that is chromium rich. And again, that will have MOLLE 4 plus and 6 plus within it. All right. One of the other things that, uh, that, that Philip's group has looked at, he's looked at the, the morphology uh, of the oxides that are formed. Uh, and so he, he's taken a look at the effects of MOLLE on the composition in nanoscale uh, using uh, STM. And so if you take a look at the, the, the top right set of images, you see an STM uh, topography uh, for the, the stainless steel oxides, and it's a nice stepped formation. And this is an air-formed native oxide film. And if we take a look at uh, a passivated ox oxide film, in this case a passivated oxide in sulfuric acid, we see very similar types of morphology, the same step type uh, of morphology, but in this case we see do, do see areas of, of attack and, and, and dimples or depressions. And Philippe uh, believes that, that these are being filled with some type of molly nanocrystal. Mm -hmm. So using these techniques in combination, using the top sims uh, as well as the, the STM and the XPS, uh, he is, he is taking steps forward to, to, to give us a better idea of what Molly might be doing uh, uh, in, in the structure of the oxide uh, to, to make the, the material stainless. Um, the last one that I'd, I'd like to talk about is, is, is in the area of corrosion control. And so I'm going to talk about some, some work that's being done here at Manchester uh, in, in Stuart Lyons' group. Uh, and so Stuart, Stuart is taking a look uh, at organic coatings, and he's mapping uh, water uptake uh, using uh, a new bit of kit, uh, the AFMIR. All right, so why is he looking at this? Well, for many years, there, there, there's been many experiences within the industry where you have long-term failures uh, of seemingly intact corrosion-resistant organic coatings. And it's not well understood why you would get a failure on something that is, is basically still there. And so what Stuart is, is, has been looking at using this new technique, he has been looking at uh, how much water uptake you get in the coating itself. And the proposed mechanism for breakdown uh, of this intact organic coating is basically the formation of a hydrophilitic uh, pathway that generally goes through the material, the, the coating, and then channels uh, to, a, to a location leading to a localized corrosion spot and eventual uh, uh, breakdown of the coating. All right. So what Stuart's been doing, he's been using this AFMIR technique uh, to, to look at water uptake characteristics on, on an epoxy uh, phenolic uh, can coating. And he's been looking at it either in uh, immersion in deionized water uh, or in relative humidity levels. All right. So, if you take a look at some of the uh, some of the uh, the data that he gets out of this system, uh, if we take a look at the top right figure, uh, we see uh, a figure of absorbance increase versus time, and this is done for uh, a dry material, uh, a material, a coating that's been soaked for one hour one day, three days, and one week. And you can see the differences in the absorption and the increase of the absorption of the OH stretch, stretch bond. And it's normalized to the, to the, the, the CH stretch band um, as a function of exposure time uh, uh, at relative humidity of up to 80%. All right. Further to, to, to making this measurement, yeah, he has also used the AFMIR to measure the height uh, uh, locally within the coating system. And in the bottom image, he's looking at uh, uh, discrepancies in height or smoothness of the surface of the coating uh, as a function of um, immersion time and as a function of different uh, relative humidities. And so he sees in the, in, the, in the higher relative humidity, you see areas in which the 
the coating is actually has dimples or areas of, of higher height uh, than, uh, than, than the general area. Right? And so the mechanism behind that is, is the thought that you are getting diffusion of water into free spaces within the coating system. And that is accompanied by a hydrogen bonding to the sites on the walls of these microvoids. And that compromises the free volume of the material. And this, this is followed by polymer relaxation. And uh, eventually, you will get something like this in the bottom right, where you get a, 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 a swelling uh, locally within the coating itself. All right? So that's, those are three nice examples of, of, of people uh, using new techniques and, and new and improved systems uh, to get a better understanding uh, of, of corrosion um, mechanisms. Uh, now I'm going I'm to go on to, to the next section of the talk where I'm going I'm to give you a, a little bit of overview of, of some of the things that I'm doing. And here again I'm going to emphasize uh, the use of, of, of new facilities and, and new techniques uh, uh, to, to get a better understanding of corrosion mechanisms. All right. So the, the first thing that I want to talk about uh, is, a, is a bit of work that I did with John Knott, Stuart Lyon, Chris Grosner, and, and Andrew Sherry. Uh, and we were looking at uh, the SEC uh, and, and atom probe studies of 304 stainless alloyed with palladium and ruthenium additions. All right. So whenever you're talking about uh, a nice new toy that, that can give you information on the at atomic scale, you talk about the atom probe. And in this case, it was, it was, it was quite good to have the capabilities of the atom probe to, to, to understand uh, a, a corrosion result that we, we didn't quite uh, have uh, any clue uh, as why you, you would get uh, the result that we saw. So what was this result? Well, we, we put PGM additions into the stainless steel at different levels. So on this plot in the, the top right, uh, you see um, uh, the palladium uh, modified material in the red and the ruthenium, ruthenium modified material in the blue. And so what we did is we sensitized all of the stainless steel. So we got it into a condition where we, we knew we had chromium depletion at the grain boundaries. And so we should get intergranular corrosion and stress corrosion cracking. In the ruthenium's case, this is exposure time in, in solution, uh, we did not see any cracking events if we went over a certain threshold of PGM additions. So in the blue, blue uh, uh, data points, we see we, we, we do not get any cracking in the U-bin specimens. Whereas when we have the, the palladium modified material, we see basically the same performance as what we would see uh, in an industrial standard. So a 304 steel without any uh, uh, PGM additions. All right. If we take a look at, at some of the, the atom probe work, and if we take a look at, at a, an out of plane uh, uh, look at a grain boundary, we see quite a few uh, 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 carbides. Uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> we, see, we see quite a few. Uh, chromium carbides laying along the boundary, but we also see uh, quite a few of these red spots. And these red spots are actually palladium manganese intermetallics. And so if we take a look at the depleted regions around the grain boundary, we see the chromium, in all cases, we've got a chromium depleted zone after these heat treatments uh, up to down to, to below 10 atomic uh, weight percent. In the case of the ruthenium, we see a fairly even amount of ruthenium across that boundary. Whereas with the palladium, we see a decrease. And so we don't see much palladium at the, at the grain boundary itself. And we wouldn't have been able to see this without the atom probe. Um, so what we did is we made another alloy without the manganese. And so the next slide shows you the results uh, of the stress corrosion cracking. So if you look at the top right, uh, this is the symbol uh, that represents the testing that we did on the palladium-modified low manganese alloy of the 304 stainless. 
and we see similar pro performance to, to that, we, that we saw in ruthenium. And if we look at the, the atom probe data, we see that we have an enrichment of palladium at the grain boundary, uh, whereas we still have this chromium depletion. So we have the ability with this alloy system uh, to, to have a sensitized microstructure or a chromium depleted zone that is not susceptible to stress corrosion cracking. Uh, so this, is, this would be very, very advantageous for critical components where you have a, a, a threat of a cracking event. Now, what we are continuing to do in this program, we are continuing to try to understand electrochemically what the palladium does and what the ruthenium does local to the grain boundary. And hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get more information on this within the next year. All right. The, the next program that I'm going to talk about is, is a program that we did um, uh, with Alan Turnbull at, at MPL uh, with, with one of my first students, uh, Tony Horner. Uh, and so what we were doing, we were using uh, in-situ x-ray tomography and digital image correlation. So in using these, these types of techniques, we are able to, to get to the root of pit to crack transitions. And so most of the time before we did this study, people would always say that if you have a pit in any type of steel, you would have the highest concentration of stress at the bottom of the pit and you would get initiation. So with, with x-ray tomography and the, the movie that I'm going to, to, to to, to play uh, on the right of the screen uh, is actually a reconstruction of, of the x-ray uh, attenuation data uh, from one of the experiments. And so this is the surface facing you uh, of the metal and we can basically see into the metal. This being a very large pit and cracks emanating from each side. So as we take a look at the reconstructed data we see that the pit is much much deeper than all the cracking events. And this led us to believe that, that it is possible that, that we are getting initiation not at the, the deepest part of the pit, but at the pit mouth. And so we went on to, to look at uh, some in situ work and we take a look at a pit with two cracks emanating from it in the SEM image. And if we look at the, the corresponding uh, uh, x-ray tomography attenuation data. And this attenuation data, what we've done here is we've basically inverted the material and we're just imaging, uh, imaging the surface of both the, the bulk material, the pit, and the cracks. So we're basically doing a very high resolution replica. And if we take a look at the tomography, we see initiation again at the mouth of the pit, not at the deepest part of the pit. The second crack more than likely has initiated at the mouth and has grown and to, to grow further uh, than the pit depth itself. We also took a look at, at, at doing some, some finite element modeling on the stress states and the strain states uh, of, of these types uh, of, of pit morphologies. And we see that, that we get actually the highest stress again, of course, is at the bottom of the pit but the highest strain levels are at the mouth of the pit. And in this system, at least, uh, the initiation of cracking or the transition between pitting and cracking has occurred at the highest strain location, not the highest stress location. And so from, from this work, uh, any observations of pit to, pit to crack transitions uh, that use predictive model, models based on the criteria defined by Kondo had to be reassessed because Kondo's model always says that you will get uh, crack initiation at the highest stress state. Right. Another thing that we did, so this is another program that, that, that we looked at, uh, here again using, using the x-ray tomography and the power of the x-ray tomography uh, coupled with uh, digital image correlation. So in this program we, we wanted to take a look at failures of, of thermal barrier coatings. And so a thermal barrier coating that, that the the, the highest use of a thermal barrier coating is, is probably going to be uh, in, in the jet engine industry. And so this is actually a, 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 a section uh, of, a, of a blade within, within a turbine. Right. And so if you take a look at the coating, you see that quite a bit of the coating is missing. 
and has spalled off. And so spallation of, of, of this coating system is detrimental to the performance of the blades because the temperature on these blades is actually higher or approaching the melting, melting point of the metal. All right, so it's very important to keep these, uh, keep these uh, coatings on the material. So why does a TBC fail? Well, a TBC fails because of a stress state or a strain state within a thermally grown oxide that is positioned between the top coat of the material and the bond coat, uh, which is connected to the, the substrate. So we wanted to be able to use X-ray tomography and digital voxel correlation to get an idea of what the stress states are as we grow this, this thermally grown oxide in situ. All right, so we were able to make a, a, a nice modified uh, rig using a modified pin specimen. Uh, here is your Utria Stabilizer Conia top coat. It's easy to see the bond coat. And then your, your nickel alloy substrate. And we took it to the synchrotrons to do some in situ uh, 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 oxidation cycle. All right. So these are, again, reconstructions of some of the tomography data that we looked at. And so this is um, uh, as a function of, of hours at 1200 degrees C. And we can definitely see in the, in the pristine as received condition, we can see a, a very well-defined bond coat, very robust looking uh, uh, EBPVD uh, uh, top coat. But as we go uh, in exposure time, and so this is the same specimen over a 60-hour period, uh, we see very much so a degradation of this interface between uh, the top coat and the bond coat. And we can also take a look, uh, if we take a look at the images on the right, we are actually uh, labeling the porosity that we see in the bond coat. Uh, and we're able to give a, 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 not only a location to it, but also a density. Right, here again, if you take a look at, this is one cross section of X-ray uh, attenuation data. And after 60 hours, we are, we are starting to lose the top coat from the material. So the one thing that we wanted to get out of the work uh, was to, to, to try and get an idea of what the strain and stress fields were uh, as that thermally grown oxide grew. Um, so one thing that, that you'll, you'll obviously see is that we don't have much data around where the TGO is. And that's unfortunate uh, due to due to the nature of the, the EBPVD uh, deposit. Uh, there, is a, there is a lot of change going on here uh, as far as, as grain recrystallization uh, within the coating itself. So we weren't able to get a stable system to see the TGO or the stress state around the TGO. But we were able to get quite a, a lot of information on how the, the top coat responds to, to the heating cycles. And, and that was quite, quite promising. All right. The next thing I want to talk about, and so we, we've talked about uh, using uh, exotic kit and 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 new new facilities to, to look at uh, uh, a corrosion degradation. One thing I haven't talked about is is modeling work, and so let me speak briefly on uh, some of the finite element modeling work that we're doing uh, here, uh, and this is some work I'm doing with uh, with JJ Wu. Uh, and Nick Stevens. Right. So what we're looking at is we're trying to model uh, crud deposition in, in a PWR uh, nuclear plant. So crud is, crud is very detrimental to the performance of, uh, of the plant and it usually occurs in a, a, a geometric uh, singularity or restriction. And these are quite plentiful in a nuclear plant, especially on the steam generator tubing. And so this is the, the uh, uh, steam generator tubing. Uh, and we see an area uh, at the quatrefold opening, which is a restriction. So it's a place where we have a fluid flow in, in a large diameter pipe going into a smaller diameter pipe. And at this place, we, we get crud deposition. And so if we take a look at one of these uh, openings restrictions, we see over time, this is the opening of the restriction. We see it closing and then fully blocked with, with deposition. 
one thing I also want to point out is is the striations that you see down 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 the restriction itself. Now we've done some some uh, experimental work looking at uh, to reproduce these uh, uh, this deposition, and, and we've been quite successful. Uh, well, we've been quite successful uh, as well as uh, Fabio Scanini's group uh, here at Manchester into reproducing this this phenomena. And what you see, if we take this work in particular, and this is some of the Arriva work that was done, oh, might be over 10 years ago now. But what you see is you see a drastic buildup of deposition right at the mouth of the uh, restriction, followed by less de deposition, but in, in a very rippled form. And this is some of the things we would like to, to try and model and try and predict. So what, what the student has done, what JJ has been doing, is she's looking at, at electrochemical, uh, electropotential kinetic mechanisms uh, for this deposition process. And more import most importantly, she is looking at, str at predicting streaming currents and wall currents uh, within, uh, within the process. All right. So the model that she's trying to generate looks at several things. So she is looking at current loops associated with this restriction in geometry. And she's looking at three things. So she is looking at an initiation of deposition at the mouth of the restriction. And then she's looking at propagation of this ripple effect going down the restriction. So an initial deposit and then deposits going down within the material. Uh, her model itself is, is based on three things. Uh, it's going to be based on transport of, of dilute species, uh, electrostatics, uh, looking at space charge densities, and, and looking at the electric current coupled with the fluid flow velocity. Some of the assumptions that she's made uh, is, is, is grounding the, the boundaries uh, electrically, uh, both at the inlet and the outlet. Uh, she assumes that the EDL is too small to change the shape, and it's not reforming uh, the ion distribution. And she only used tafel kinetics uh, for the cathodic and processes. And she uses both butler volmer as well as Robertson equations uh, within the model. And so this is some of the results of the model. And I will take a look at two things. Let's take a look at two, two images. If we look at the very bottom image, this is actually the flow velocity field. And we see at the, at the, the, at an artificial deposit that we put in the system at the mouth of the restriction we see actually a recirculation of flow. And as we model this, we see that this re recirculation corresponds to a recirculation of current as well, or two current loops. One a nodic current loop, one cathodic current loop. And so what we see is that any deposition, we generate current loops. And it is these current loops that, that, that cause uh, deposition. And so it is the anodic side of the, the streaming current that causes the deposition as we go through from Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus. All right, so these, these sites where we get deposition are, are in effect galvanic couples. And so if we take a look at the normal current density uh, along the res restriction step, we see a very high anodic, anodic spot uh, just at the, uh, the, the mouth of the restriction, followed by a cathodic section and then another anodic section. So this isn't the case where we're just getting deposition at the mouth, but if we put another deposition spot down the, the restriction, we generate another anodic spot. So once we get one piece of deposition, we will always get this ripple effect going down the material. So as you recirculate flow uh, through the material, you see that you get this dep deposition process. And we see that, that as we have initiated at the mouth of, the, of, of uh, the restriction, the model does predict this heavy deposit at that mouth. Um, this is just, just a list of some of the, the other activities that I do. Uh, so uh, I am the, 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 the EDF uh, Royal Academy of Engineering reader, so a lot of them are nuclear side. Uh, we're looking at film forming amines and we're looking at them at high temperature, high pressure in, in the nuclear environment and, and we'll probably also irradiate them to see, to see some, some changes. I, I know the oil and gas people have, have, have looked at film forming amines for, for many years, 
but we're going to put it into a, a slightly different environment. I also do quite a bit of irradiation damage work, and I'm going to start a program next year looking at uh, super hydrophobic coatings, uh, 2D coatings such as graphene, functional ceramics, uh, and so uh, that that's quite exciting uh, as well because we do have in situ capability. Uh, up at the Dalton Cumbria facility to expose at high temperature, high pressure, and irradiate at the same time. Also, have a program looking at uh, RPV steels. So it's not really corrosion anymore, but is degradation. So we're, we're setting up some small angle uh, neutron scattering uh, as well as positron annihilation studies uh, with the Chinese. Um, I continue to do a little bit of oxidation work. Uh, so I, I have some long-term steam oxidation work uh, to support the AGR boilers uh, in this country. And we're also looking for the fusion guys. We're looking at oxidation uh, of uh, uh, high entropy alloys, uh, vanadium-based high entropy alloys uh, for the fusion applications. And, and the last program that, that, that might be interested in to people is looking at uh, uh, chrome-free sacrificial CERMET coatings. So un unlike the, the, the polymer systems in, in which you can encapsulate um, inhibitors fairly easily, uh, well, not fairly easily, but, but it, people have been successful in that, we're looking to do it with now with a, a CERMAC coating system, uh, which has a, a little bit of a higher temperature regime that it experiences. Well, with that, I think that is all I have today. And I'll play one last image for you. This is a caustic crack uh, coming out of uh, the heat affected zone of a weld. It caused quite a mess. All right, well, thank you for listening today. And uh, I'll, I'll take a look and see if there's any questions. Uh, and uh, I'll probably, uh, we'll probably either uh, answer the questions uh, in the next few minutes.